Before we jump straight into partial derivatives, let's first revisit what df by dx actually means. At its heart, it's just this limit which you've probably seen many times. It's a way of asking how much does the output of a function f change when we make a tiny, tiny nudge to its input x. We call that tiny nudge h, and we want to see what happens as h gets really, really small, approaching 0. If we plot a graph of x squared um, to understand its rate of change at a specific point, we pick two points. Let's call them a and b. The line connecting them is called a secant line, and its slope gives us the average rate of change between a and b. But as we move point B closer and closer to A, the distance between them, that little h, gets smaller. When h gets practically close to zero, that secant line becomes the tangent line. And its slope isn't an approximation anymore. It's the instantaneous rate of change right at that single point. So we can say that the derivative at point A is the slope of that tangent line. For this particular curve at x equals 2, that slope is exactly 1.6. To sum up what we have seen so far, we can confidently say these three key things. First, derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. It is the slope of the tangent line to a curve. And third, it's something that applies to functions of a single variable living in a flat 2D world. Moving forward, if you have a function of two or more variables, which you'd be dealing with in most real world applications, the output of f depends on both of these variables, which are independent of each other. We can take this function as an example. Now, how do we find the rate of change here if we change both x and y at the same time? Since x and y are independent, we can only find derivatives with respect to x and y separately. Finding the derivative with respect to x gives us partial information, a partial derivative, as we will be treating y as a constant. That is why we have a separate notation for this, like that curly d. And look at the definition. It's almost identical to the classic derivative. We are nudging x by a tiny amount h. But notice that y just stays y. It's treated as a constant. Same thing for y. We change y a tiny bit and keep x as a constant. Let's see this in a graph for better understanding. Now, we'll have a 3D space and a surface instead of a 2D curve. This surface represents our Gaussian bump function's output. The height or z value is determined by the x and y coordinates on the floor. Finding the partial derivative with respect to x means we have to hold y constant. It's like taking a vertical slice through our surface. The result is just a simple 2D curve. And for a 2D curve, we already know how to find the rate of change. As this dot moves, its path is determined only by the changing x value. The green line shows the tangent, the slope, at every point along that slice. That slope is the partial derivative with respect to x. It's the instantaneous rate of change in the x direction. For doing the same for y, we hold x constant, which again gives us a 2D curve on a different slice of the surface. And as we move along this new path, where only y is changing, the slope of the tangent line gives us the partial derivative with respect to y. So that's the core idea. Partial derivatives let us handle complex 3D surfaces by breaking the problem down into simple 2D slopes that we already understand. Now let's actually calculate these partial derivatives for our specific function. For the partial derivative with respect to x, we treat y as a constant and differentiate the equation with respect to x. The derivative of x square y is 2xy and the derivative of 2xy is 2y. So we get 2xy plus 2y. For the partial derivative with respect to y, we treat x as a constant. So the derivative of x square y is x square and the derivative of 2xy is 2x. So we get x square plus 2x. Pretty simple, right? But what if y itself actually depends on x? 
or maybe on some other variable t or what if both x and y are changing together because they both depend on some other variable like time t now x is a function of t and y is a function of t so f ultimately depends on t but indirectly through x and y if we change t just a little bit how much does f change in this case just taking the partial derivatives with respect to x and y isn't enough anymore because a change in t affects both we need to account for both paths and find the total change in f with respect to t that is why we also need to calculate the change in x with respect to t meaning dx by dt similarly dy by dt since x and y both depend only on t that is why we can write d instead of the partial derivatives curly d adding both terms will give us the total derivative of f with respect to t this is the chain rule for multivariable functions it's a way of adding up all the different ways a change in our root variable t can ripple through the system to affect the final output f let's take this example suppose we have this new function f and x and y are defined by these functions of t we can either just substitute everything in and then take its derivative with respect to t or we can take derivatives separately first we find the partials of f with respect to x and y we do this by treating the other variable as a constant just like before then we find the derivatives of x and y with respect to t which is straightforward now we just plug everything into our chain rule formula after substituting x and y back in and simplifying we get our final answer 10t to the 4th minus 8t this tells us the total instantaneous rate of change of our function f as t changes all right let's push this one step further what if we have an even more complex system u depends on x y and z but x only depends on t z only depends on s and y depends on both t and s how do we describe the total change in u now finding du by dt won't be sufficient here neither will finding du by ds the total change du will have a contribution from the change in t and a contribution from the change in s to find the part that depends on t we look at all the paths from u to t u changes with x and x changes with t so we have the partial derivative of u with respect to x times the partial derivative of x with respect to t u also changes with y and y changes with t so we add partial u over partial y times partial y over partial t now you might be thinking why have i written the partial derivative of x with respect to t instead of dx by dt when x only depends on t this is because they both mean the same thing since there is only one input variable in other words we can say that an ordinary derivative is just a special case of a partial derivative used when there is only one variable involved so this is just to keep the notation consistent here but for y writing partial makes perfect sense since y depends on both t and s now for the s part we trace the paths to s u changes with y and y changes with s that gives us partial u by partial y times partial y by partial s and u changes with z and z changes with s so we add partial u by partial z times partial z by partial s and that's it this is the total differential it captures the complete picture of how u changes when we nudge all of its underlying independent variables here's a practice problem with this exact dependency structure if you'd like to try it yourself moving forward to understand it deeper we can discuss the directional derivative which is the dot product of two vectors the first vector is the gradient of u which is simply a vector containing all of u's partial derivatives it points in the direction of the steepest ascent on our surface the second vector is the velocity vector which describes the direction and speed of our path in the xy plane and their dot product tells us the rate of change of our function u in the specific direction we are moving it's an incredibly powerful concept in physics engineering computer graphics etc if you want a detailed video on this topic please tell me in the comments below and i'll see you in the next video